Good afternoon. My name is Mark Siegler, and I have the honor of welcoming you all to the eighth uh, annual symposium hosted by the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence. Uh, we would like to begin the afternoon uh, with an introduction of our keynote speaker by Dean Kenneth Polanski. As you all know, Dean Polanski is the Executive Vice President at the University for Biology and Medicine, President of the University of Chicago Health System, Dean of the Division of Biological Sciences, and Dean of the Pritzker School of Medicine, and the Richard T. Crane Distinguished Service Professor of Medicine. Um, Ken will be introducing our keynote speaker, and here's Dean Polanski. Thank you, Mark, and uh, it's wonderful that you're all here. It's great to have such a uh, good turnout and uh, a wonderful occasion, and it's my pleasure to welcome Holly back to the University of Chicago and to introduce her. Uh, I have to introduce her now as the president of the J Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation. I haven't quite gotten used to that yet, uh, but maybe over time I will. Um, she is also a chair of the board of directors of the Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine. Um, so, uh, as you know, um, the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation uh, is the only national foundation dedicated solely to improving the education of health professionals, uh, and that is uh, clearly what uh, Holly has uh, devoted her career to doing. Uh, as you know, she is a graduate of the Pritzker School of Medicine. Um, she then was a, a resident here in internal medicine, a pulmonary and critical care fellow, uh, and then she joined the faculty. She was initially the director of the medical residency training program. Arthur appointed her uh, to that, uh, and then she was the uh, dean for medical education uh, at the Pritzker School of Medicine from 2003 to 2018. And uh, I think we all know that uh, Holly is one of the outstanding medical educators in the country. She um, introduced a whole series of curricula and other initiatives while she was the Dean for Medical Education at the Pritzker School of Medicine. <clears throat> and uh, I think in particular the um, relationship that she had with the uh, medical students and the environment that she created for supportive learning at the University of Chicago is actually unparalleled. Uh, I think that nothing says it more than the fact that she was designated um, as one of the favorite professors by our graduating students 25 times. So that's a, um, you know, that's a, a record that I don't think will ever be broken, Holly. And, uh, you know, clearly, um, I mean, as we know, when the medical students speak, it's always uh, with sincerity and from the heart. And uh, they, uh, they, they designated you that for very good reason. So we're absolutely delighted that you're back and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ken, and uh, thank you for being in this room today. It is such an unbelievable treat um, for me to be back um, on the campus of the University of Chicago and standing in this room um, this afternoon, and also knowing that just across the street, um, I, I understand there are more than 100 students who've been accepted to the Pritzker School of Medicine who are here revisiting to see where, in fact, they'll enroll. So. Although I should be um, agnostic on this, um, <laughs> I hope you all know who I'm rooting for. Um, so um, today's talk um, will be a very broad overview of what I consider to be a very, very important topic. And I know that there are people in this room who have deep expertise with various components of this topic, and I hope that during the discussion, we may have an opportunity to learn from the expertise that you bring to this topic. I titled the topic as I did because there was a time and place in history when the tolling of church bells signified important announcements that the community needed to be aware of and pay attention to. And when John Donne wrote these words, 400 years ago, he in fact wrote these words with the expectation that the tolling of those church bells 
were pertaining to a funeral. And in fact, the funeral he was worried about was his own. Because he had been sick for a number of days. In fact, he had been so sick that he had been quarantined. And so he was in social isolation with a very high fever. And it was on the eve of one of his daughter's weddings when he wrote the words that were published in 1624, Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions, together with Death's Duel. And over the many hundreds of years since he wrote those words, scholars have had an opportunity to comment on the way in which the words he wrote spoke to the social and cultural interconnectedness of humanity. And so over the course of the afternoon, I want to invite us to think about those words as we are, in fact, interconnected. So what were the words? And I'm not going to repeat all of them, but the excerpts that are most relevant. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And so when thinking about the very important topic of physician burnout and wellness, it is never a topic that pertains to a single burned out physician or nurse. It's never a topic that pertains to an individual with depression or with suicide. It is a topic not only for our profession, but a topic for all of society. And so over the course of the next several minutes, I'm going to try to begin with a few definitions so that we'll hopefully be on the same page about what we're talking about. I will present one framework um, that addresses this topic, three examples from three uh, basic categories of the framework, and then I will outline a potential way forward. So let's start with the definitions. And we'll begin with the learning environment itself. And this definition came from a conference sponsored by the Macy Foundation last April. And you see it here, the social interactions, organizational culture, and physical and virtual spaces that surround and shape the experiences, perceptions, and learning of students and residents. Many of us have spent the morning thinking about institutional culture. Culture turns out to be very important, and here you see culture defined by McKinsey and Company, the cumulative effect of what people do and how they do it. That seems pretty straightforward. Miriam Webster goes into a little bit more detail. The customary beliefs, social forms, and material traits of a group. Also, the characteristic features of everyday existence shared by people in a place or time. I think this definition more accurately captures the experience that students have as a group, that residents have as cohorts in our residency programs here and all across the country. Culture, we know, is very important, and it was the business strategist, Peter Drucker, who first said the culture is so important that it'll eat strategy for breakfast. Over the years, his statement has been adopted by others to claim that organizational culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I think the point is, obviously, that it's very, very important. So among the things we do as a profession is not only do we work together, but we take oaths, and in fact, we invite our students in this particular medical school to take an oath at the time of their white coat ceremony, and again, at the time of graduation. And schools use various versions of the Hippocratic Oath. We use the modern version of the Hippocratic Oath. Many schools write their own oaths, and there is a physician's pledge that many schools have adopted from the World Health Organization. Importantly, oath-taking is a part of our profession, and I'll have more to say about that. What about the definition of burnout? The classic definition and the one used most by scholars is this one by Maslick, first coined in 1981 and then further refined and validated through a series of elegant um, studies. The syndrome is characterized by emotional exhaustion, 
depersonalization and decreased personal accomplishment. The burnout statistics recently published by Derby and um, verified, first published in 2014 and then verified in a more recent study that's not yet published, is that the groups that seem particularly vulnerable to burnout turn out to be medical students and residents. That is not to say that burnout is not an issue for practicing physicians. And um, that question is being looked at at various stages of a physician's career, early career, mid-career, late career. It's also the case that many are studying burnout um, among nurses and other types of healthcare professionals. But for the purposes of today, we're going to focus on students and residents. And this is the most accurate data that we have related um, to those two groups of people. This is my favorite definition of burnout, and it was authored by our own medical school graduate, Richard Gunderman, who is not only a graduate of our medical school, but who has a PhD from the Committee on Social Thought. And in 2014, in The Atlantic, he published this definition. Burnout at its deepest level is not the result of some train wreck of examinations, long call shifts, or poor clinical evaluations. It is the sum total of hundreds and thousands of tiny betrayals of purpose, each one so minute that it hardly attracts notice. I will come back to this later in my talk. What about resilience? Resilience is to spring back or rebound. Um, Serlenek coined this particular definition, which I think is helpful. It is a set of attributes demonstrated by an individual over time with an ability to succeed despite stress or adversity that normally involves the real possibility of a negative outcome. I think this clearly um, applies to the medical education and patient care settings. What about well-being? This concept is much, much more difficult to define. Um, this definition from the Oxford Dictionary, the state of being comfortable, healthy, or happy, I would invite us to ask any medical student or resident if this is even consistent with their life. Um, I found it lacking. Um, interestingly, I discovered that the Centers for Disease Control has a definition of well-being, and here is theirs. In simple terms, well-being can be described as judging life positively and feeling good. But for me, the definition that best captures our work is a definition by the World Health Organization, which says this, a state of reaching one's potential while coping with the normal stresses of life and working productively and fruitfully while making a contribution to one's community. Okay, so with that background, let's turn to framework. About four years ago, I found myself standing across the street in one of the main lecture halls in the Biological Sciences Learning Center. It was um, an afternoon when many of the faculty and I were working with the second year medical students and proudly introducing to them that that afternoon we were going to be sharing with them many of the concrete steps that we would help them take as they began to think about their future careers and apply for residency and as they thought about the more immediate goal of their third year clerkships, which were several months away. In the course of explaining this to the students, I mentioned that um, we were going to host um, a series of resilience workshops for their participation. And after a few more um, minutes of my explanation, from the back of the room, one of the students raised their hand and said to me, Dr. Humphrey, why are you trying to fix us rather than the broken system? And so I, of course, don't remember exactly what I said, other than I think I said something like, well, I hope we're actually going to address both. But it's not that we're trying to fix you. We think you're fine just the way you are. We want to make sure you have some skills um, that perhaps you don't have that you might be able to use um, when you need them. Honestly, I think that student remained very skeptical of that um, answer from me. But I was very interested to learn Earlier this last summer, when the National Academy of Medicine published this framework 
on clinician well-being. And I want to take just a moment and invite you to look carefully at this framework. At the center, we find our patients and their well-being. And then our patients' care and their well-being is surrounded by the clinician-patient relationship, that which the Buxbaum Institute is squarely focused on. The next circle is clinician well-being, the source of my topic here today. In the yellow boxes surrounding the concentric cir green circles in the middle, you see yellow boxes indicating all of the external factors that affect well-being. And what you see at the very top is one of those boxes being society and culture. And then to your left, rules and regulations, organizational factors, the learning and practice environment, and healthcare responsibilities. And then there are two blue boxes. And the two blue boxes are the individual factors, personal factors and skills and, ab and abilities. So my student from four years ago, who's now off in residency, probably just about finishing residency, was on to something. He knew that the personal factors would only take him so far, and that these yellow boxes representing the cultural and systems and learning environment factors were going to be way beyond his control. So for the purposes of this afternoon, I want to focus on society and culture and the learning environment. And I'll do that by inviting us to consider three examples from three um, categories. And these um, examples are all real examples. I haven't made them up. Um, and we'll see together um, what you think. So the first is society and culture. And the example that I'm going to share is specifically focused on alignment of societal expectations with the clinician's role and political and economic climates. OK, so to illustrate this example, um, I'm using um, a, a piece of uh, great scientific discovery, a discovery that was made in 1921 when Banting and Best and their dog model discovered insulin. That discovery changed the world. And that is not an overstatement. It took children and adults who were literally malnourished leading to death, and overnight gave them life and the chance for as normal a life as one might hope by administering insulin on a daily basis. And so I don't know if you saw it this January when Danielle Orphy in the New York Times published an opinion piece entitled The Insulin Wars. I'm not going to share the entire piece. If you haven't read it, I highly commend it to you. But I'll share just a few excerpts from her experience taking care of a patient on insulin. Here's what she said. Her patient called her and said, doctor, could you please redo my insulin prescription? The one you gave me is wrong. My patient's preferred insulin changed three times in a year, so each time she went to the pharmacy, her prescription was rejected. It's a colossal time waster as patients, pharmacists, and doctors log hours upon hours calling, faxing, texting, and emailing to keep up with whichever insulin is trending. It's also dangerous as patients can end up without a critical medication for days, weeks, waiting for these bureaucratic kinks to get ironed out. She then said to her patient, so just tell me, which is the preferred insulin, I told the pharmacist briskly. There was a pause before the pharmacist replied. There isn't one. This was a new low. An insurance company now had no insulins on its top tier. Breaking the news to my patient was devastating. Over the last 20 years, the price of milk has increased 21%. The 
the price of a Dodge minivan has increased 23%. The price of insulin humalogen in this case, 1,157%. Let me turn to one additional example. And this example also brings together the incredible earth-shattering scientific advances, which in this case occurred in 1989 at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, when scientists there discovered the gene causing cystic fibrosis. And if you were to um, look, actually, with just simple Google searches on the internet, you can find um, first-hand accounts from patients and their families about this particular conundrum. And so I'm going to share just a brief excerpt from one of those postings. My name is Julia Keating, and my son Eli is a five-year-old boy who loves pizza, Legos, and construction trucks. This weekend, Eli played Frisbee at the National Mall, rode his scooter, and took a spin on the merry-go-round with friends at the park. Looking at such an active and happy child, it may come as a surprise that he has an illness called cystic fibrosis, a rare disease that he shares with 30,000 people in the United States. Eli's joyful existence stands in stark contrast to the war raging within his little body. CF is an insidious illness that will, over time, lay my son's lungs to ruin while wrecking other organs. His future may include multiple organ transplants, and the disease is ultimately terminal. The good news is, recently, a life-extending medical discovery was made by a Boston-based drug corporation, Vertex, which gave me hope for my son and for all of us. And then I learned the price of this drug, $327,000 a month. And she goes on, like many other patients, to describe how impossible that situation is. This has received a widespread news coverage, uh, both in the lay press, in the scientific community, and even uh, last week, there was more testimony um, in front of Congress uh, related to prescription drug prices. So when our students take the oath, the words they say include, I will respect the hard-won scientific gains of those physicians in whose steps I walk. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart, a cancerous growth, but a sick human being whose illness may affect the person's family and economic stability. Let's turn to another example, this one from the learning and practice environment and specifically focusing on a collaborative versus a competitive environment in the curriculum. And this uh, first example is one that is being widely and uh, very vigorously discussed by medical educators and deans and students all across the country. And it was well um, captured in a paper published just a few months ago in academic medicine when a group of medical students representing schools actually all across the country talked about the learning environment and their perspective on the step one climate in pre-medical education. So in our schools and in schools all across America, it's not uncommon that lecturers show up to deliver their lecture to an empty classroom. And the students very eloquently described why that's happening. It's happening because of the unintended pressure created by a step one score that will determine whether or not they will be invited to interview at a variety of residency programs, generally in a very small number of disciplines, um, the surgical subspecialties, but it's not necessarily limited just to those disciplines. There's another related example uh, in the learning and practice environment. There are actually hundreds of examples, and I know that you all know them well. But for the purposes of today, the other one that I wanted to highlight um, involves what happens in our day-to-day -day interactions um, in our clerkships. And so while this is a, a real example, it is not an example from the University of Chicago. So a third-year student on morning rounds with the attending physician, residents, nurses, and other students asked the senior resident, which patient would you like me to see next, the patient scheduled for a C-section or the patient in labor in the emergency department? 
the senior residents' response, I want you to help housekeeping make the beds. When students graduate from medical schools, they're invited to complete the graduation questionnaire, which has a very um, detailed section on student mistreatment. And among the questions they are asked is this one, how frequently have you experienced public humiliation, derogatory remarks, discrimination based on gender, race, sexual orientation, or other personal traits or beliefs? Last year, um, the percent of medical school graduates who reported experiencing one or more of these behaviors, and this is aggregated data all across the country, was 42%. The year before, it had been 39%. And this is an issue um, that uh, the AAMC and medical schools have now been following for many, many years, um, more than a decade. So going back to that definition of burnout, did that example on morning rounds in any way stand up as one of the sum total of hundreds and thousands of tiny betrayals, each one so minute it hardly attracts notice? I don't know, but what I do know is those kinds of interactions really do take a toll and they add up over time. So let's turn to the third um, and final set of examples under society and culture. And this one involves discrimination and overt and unconscious bias and patient behaviors and expectations. And um, you've probably seen a fair amount being written about this, uh, both in the lay press and in the academic um, community. And this involves harassment and racism in the doctor-patient relationship. Um, you may be aware that last summer, the National Academy of Medicine published a very important study on the sexual harassment of women. And there are many, many um, features to this report, but there is one feature that was new um, to the accumulated uh, data that the group reviewed, and that is um, the following conclusion. Women students, trainees, and faculty in academic medical centers experience sexual harassment by patients and patients' families in addition to the elevated levels of harassment they also experience from colleagues and from those in leadership positions. And then a perspective piece from the New England Journal of Medicine in 2016 um, actually published by a fellow from the Greenwall, who is, whose work was supported by the Greenwall Foundation, um, with a, actually a very helpful article on how to manage the doctor-patient relationship if the patient is expressing racist comments. One of the comments from that article is this one. For many minority healthcare workers, expressions of patients' racial preferences are painful and degrading indignities which cumulatively contribute to moral distress and burnout. So when our students take the oath and they say, I will remember that I remain a member of society with special obligations to all my fellow human beings, it turns out that that, like the other statements in this oath, can be very challenging. And they can be especially challenging to interact if the overall culture does not have elements in that culture that support and call out examples that go wrong. So there has to be a way forward, because everything I've shared so far is pretty depressing. So um, what does a way forward look like? Well, you might um, not be surprised to know that institutions all across the country are taking this seriously. And in fact, you heard about and know about um, the Resilience Week that um, this institution has sponsored for a number of years. Well, it turns out that medical schools also have curricula in uh, resilience and in well-being. And um, one of the well-being curricula uh, published just uh, this January, uh, this study by uh, Lisette Derby at the Mayo Clinic, in fact, surveyed the group of AMA Accelerating Change Medical Schools, and 59% of those schools had well-being curricula for their students, 31% had optional attendance, 13% had required attendance for these activities. And what did the activities consist of? 
debt counseling, financial wellness, stress management reduction, and gym membership, just to give you a, a sampling. 93% um, of those um, had mindfulness meditation training, 96% had social events, 85% physical activity through organized activity, and 82% with student well-being committees um, or actually naming a staff person um, or dean for responsibility for that oversight. And you probably are aware that there's been a recent um, discussion and debate about whether or not health systems should um, promote and appoint um, chief wellness officers. So I think we'll have a lot more um, that we're going to learn about that. Are there things beyond uh, well-being curricula that we can do? Well, I was interested that just a few days ago, um, JAMA Online published a very interesting paper from the Harvard School of Public Health um, inviting all of us to think about our definition of health and, in fact, titled their paper, Reimagining Health Flourishing. And the thing that was particularly striking about this paper is not only did they invite us to rethink our definition of health for our patients, but they pointed out that everything they were saying about health for their patients applied equally to the health of the health care provider. And so this um, framework that they presented in the paper, where the domains of flourishing were happiness, mental and physical health, meaning and purpose, character, close social relationships, and financial stability, they invited um, readers to test this framework both with patients and with themselves as healthcare um, professionals. So I think that we will hear more um, from, from these investigators uh, from Harvard, and I think it invites us to think about whether or not um, there are elements of flourishing, which we can not only use to monitor ourselves and perhaps our environments, but also um, the invitation to think about health more broadly. Now, what about another way to make important change in our learning environments is with accreditation standards. Now, unlike the paper on flourishing, which was just published on April 1st, the two accreditation standards I'm about to show you uh, both have been around for more than a decade. However, they have caused uh, real attention in um, institutions, and so I want to just um, make sure that we're all aware that um, all medical schools in this country are held to standard three on the learning environment, which states that a medical school ensures that the learning environment of its medical education program is conducive to the ongoing development of explicit and appropriate professional behaviors, that individuals are treated with respect, that the institution identifies positive and negative influences on the maintenance of professional standards, and that the institution identifies and promptly corrects violations of those professional standards. It's also the case that the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education in introducing the Clinical Learning Environment Review Program, otherwise known as CLEAR, had expectations about the learning environment, although I'm inviting you right now to look at the language in this standard, which applies to medical schools, and I find it interesting, and um, it's certainly uh, different. It's a different frame of reference for the residency programs. So the learning environment standard that applies to all institutions offering graduate medical education program is that residency education must occur in the context of a learning and working environment that emphasizes safety and quality, excellence in professionalism through faculty modeling of the effacement of self-interest in a humanistic environment, and the joy of curiosity, problem solving, intellectual rigor, and discovery, and then a commitment to well-being. So again, two really important sets of accreditation standards that govern our medical schools and our residency and fellowship programs, both of which have been in place for more than a decade. 
Last April, when the Josiah Macy Foundation convened a conference of thought leaders from across the country, they too came up with a series of recommendations that I'm going to share with you very quickly um, and then uh, finish. So the recommendations that the Macy Foundation came up with to use as a lever to impact and change our learning environments are the following. Starting at the very top, engage academic and healthcare organization governance. Governance bodies and executive leadership should ensure positive learning and work environments and be held accountable for allocating the resources to achieve this. Engage executive leadership to provide organizational support. That healthcare organizations should create cultures in which resources, policies, and processes support optimal learning environments across the continuum of health professions education. That creating physical and virtual spaces for learning should ensure appropriate, flexible, and safe spaces for learning. That institutions should provide faculty and staff development by having the leaders of health professions education and healthcare organizations ensuring continuous learning and development opportunities for their faculty and staff to improve the learning environment. And that the institution should promote and support research and scholarship. Those in positions of responsibility for learning environments should be committed to continuously evaluating, improving, and conducting research on the learning environment. And then finally, setting policy. Health professions, education, and healthcare organization leaders and accreditors should engage in policy advocating for improvements in health professions learning environments. So where does that leave us? It leaves us thinking about a new tomorrow with our patients at the center of the framework, being cared for by students who are supported and nurtured and taught in the ways that live up to the Hippocratic Oath and to our highest professional standards, along with the residents who are engaged not only in the learning as an important part of their experience, but as the direct provision of patient care and the bottom line, order writers. And that those students and residents will work side by side and under the supervision and tutelage of our faculty, of other health care providers and institutional leaders, so that both one on one in the doctor patient relationship and collectively, we might be advocates for our patients, whether it's at a national policy level or the individual level with the patient in front of us, so that our teams of health care providers will remember that we're all in this together. That any time someone is suffering, we are all suffering. And it's only together that our oaths have the chance to become real, both on paper and in the day-to-day -day experience of caring for patients. I'm going to stop there and uh, see, Mark, whether I should invite questions now. OK. So. Um, I would be happy to entertain your questions. Thank you. Yes, Jordy. Excellent uh, uh, set of <coughs> observations and suggestions about how we can go forward. One of the things that, that I think needs to be emphasized is that in the course of of, of a busy clinical environment, the time that we have to spend with our patients to, re, to develop the relationships that ultimately are the source of the joy and the professional satisfaction that comes from being a doctor, or being a health profession. And the environments in which we are now working are so heavily influenced by the commercialism and the need for productivity and for cost containment that the people who are establishing the work rooms around which the doctors are functioning is incompatible with this time that we need. So, but what is not uh, sufficiently emphasized, and I think here is something the profession needs to embrace, is that there is a strong business case to be made for allowing healthcare professionals to have the time to develop these relationships because they improve patient outcomes, improve compliance, reduce hospitalization, all the things that we're trying to accomplish to 
save money are in fact supported by a strong doctor-patient relationship, which requires time to develop and to maintain. So I think one of the responsibilities we have as a profession is to advocate, speak truth to power, right. emphasize the data that exists that supports the notion that this is really a strong business case that can be made for restructuring our clinical environment so they in fact allow for sufficient time for these relations. Yes, yeah, so um, I hope you were all able to hear Dr. Cohen's comments um, about the importance of a business case. I do hope that the National Academy of Medicine is going to um, outline the elements of the business case, which you just um, summarized, I think, so beautifully. Tate Shanafelt um, at Stanford, who's done a lot of the background research in this area, has commented that the number of physicians who need to drop out of um, the practice of medicine for either uh, depression, suicide, or burnout on an annual basis is the equivalent of seven medical schools um, worth of students. Um, so that's another part of that business case. Yes. Hi, Stacy. Hi, Kelly. Welcome back. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your talk. Um, this probably doesn't. This certainly doesn't apply to every medical school, but many medical schools are parts of larger universities. And on this campus in particular, we have um, held ourselves out uh, as the defenders of the limits of free speech. And that ethos, which I support, I think comes into tension with the problem of the micro. You didn't use the word microaggressions, right. but it's another right. word right. to describe those daily small insults. Right. That we tolerate a very broad range of interpersonal behavior that, to, that, that one could say falls well below the standards you describe. Right. Um, because to compromise, <clears throat> say, not even just the behavior, but the spoken word, would be in tension with our value around free speech. So I wonder whether, and, and so then it becomes very difficult to enforce change uh, with respect to those microaggressions. Have you, have you thought of this? Or have you seen it play out elsewhere? And what do we do about it? I have definitely thought about this um, right on this very campus and um, have had many um, opportunities to discuss this with uh, individuals in the provost's office and uh, with the president of our university. And, um, they are very quick, I think, to point out that the university's position on free speech is different than the healthcare system and the direct provision of patient care, where the standards have to be different. Um, but it's the faculty who get caught um, in that conundrum. Um, I personally have found, with the provost and president taking that point of view, a lot more freedom in uh, using some of the tools that have been recently published. I pointed to the paper from the New England Journal of Medicine, but over the last two or three years, there have been a number of very helpful papers published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine, that I have found um, very helpful in the concrete language that they suggest be used if a patient says a certain thing or a patient's family member, how the attending physician should respond. And the respond or the responses that are recommended in those papers definitely um, emphasize affirmation of hearing what the patient is saying, but setting a limit and letting the patient know that if the comment was directed to a student, for example, or a resident on their team, that that student and resident are an integral part of the team and that they cannot be talked to that way. And the authors of these various papers have gone to, I think, great length to understand the importance of speaking up as it's happening and not um, saving it for a debriefing at the end of the clerkship or the end of the month, but to really model how to manage a patient who may be saying very inappropriate things and how to simultaneously care for the patient and care for the trainees. So I, I recommend those papers to you because I've found them very helpful. Yes.
Yeah, so excellent, excellent question. And in fact, everything you just described is highlighted in that paper that I cited from Lisette Derby from the Mayo Clinic 2014, where the burnout rates of students were the highest burnout rates of any group sampled in her study. They were quickly followed by residents. And the explanation of Dr. Derby and her colleagues for that distinction, and it was based on some qualitative research parameters in the paper, was exactly the issue you just spoke to, that it's the students who are being evaluated. Sometimes it seems unfair. Sometimes it seems arbitrary. Um, and that constant evaluation was the number one um, factor for the very high rates of burnout among students. Now, you ask a very important follow-up question, and that is, what are we doing about that? And um, I'm certainly feeling a sense of urgency, because um, this is actually an old problem. And while there have been some changes over time, they haven't changed quickly enough. So some of the things that institutions are, are doing, and there are many wonderful examples currently in play and being written about, involve, involve shifting much more of the student evaluation to more formative experiences. And they're doing that through the use of coaches and direct feedback, trained evaluators, so that immediate feedback um, is provided to the student in a formative and learning way. The part of the equation that is not yet solved and the part that I feel the urgency around is the summative evaluation and how it gets used. Now, residency programs will always say, medical schools are not being transparent enough about the performance of their students, or we have thousands and thousands of applicants. There's no way for us to sort through the applications. And if the medical school won't give us any meaningful information that we can trust, we simply won't interview anybody from that medical school. So program directors are in a bind for trying to find the best residents to join their program with an overwhelming number of applications, and they resort to the one numerical point that all schools, all students are going to report on, and that's that um, USMLE score. A few weeks ago, actually it was during match week, um, there was a convening conference of all of the most important people who have, the, have at their hands the ability to change the system. And I have spoken to several people who attended that conference. Every single person um, had the same exact uh, response, and the response was this. Number one, it's a much more complicated problem than it appears. <laughs> Number two, um, I feel hopeful about our ability to solve it. And number three, I don't know how quickly we can do it. <laughs> I wish I had a better answer. Mark, are you asking me to stop? No. <laughs> OK. Thank you all. Um, I think we'll have more opportunities to discuss this over the afternoon.